Chapter 11. The mouse struggled, biting at Cole's fingers with razor-sharp teeth, its tiny feet clawing frantically to escape. Cole pitied the scared little mouse, but he held on, gripping with all his strength. This mouse was his quarry, like a gull catching a herring or an owl catching a rabbit. He squeezed the mouth, mouse, but was too weak to stop the struggling. Cole felt the mouse squirming free, so quickly he brought his fist to his mouth. He pressed his hand against his lips and forced the struggling rodent between his teeth. It kept struggling, biting at Cole's lips and tongue. Cole bit down too. A tiny bone crunched. The mouse spasmed but kept squirming. Cole bit again, but his jaw lacked, uh, lacked strength. Still, the mouse wiggled and twisted, frantically chewing at Cole's tongue. For a brief second, Cole felt a furry head pass between his back teeth, and he willed his jaws together with every ounce of strength he could gather. The small skull crushed, and then the mouse stiffened and quit squirming. With the dead mouse bunched in his cheek, Cole rested his jaw. Occasionally, the tiny body twitched. Gradually, Cole worked his teeth together, gnawing on the body. Salty fluids filled his mouth, and he forced himself to, again, imagine a baby sparrow with an opened beak. Food was energy, and energy was life. Eating the mouse exhausted Cole, and by the time he had chewed up the tiny bones and swallowed the wad of tough furry skin, he lay spent, mouth gaping open. His jaw ached and felt hollow. Mosquitoes landed on his lips and tongue at will. His skin had become swollen and puffy, burning with a fiery itch. Cole wanted desperate, desperately to live, but how? The wretched insect sucked life from his faster than he could replenish it. He closed his eyes to the bloodletting, but that did not stop the torment. In the maddening darkness, he sensed another movement. Again, he opened his eyes, half expecting to see the spirit bear. Instead, he found two seagulls near his head, pecking fish chunks from the vomit he had thrown up in the grass. My puke, Cole thought. They're eating my puke. In that moment, Cole realized how badly he wanted to live. The food he had thrown up was still food. Those fish bits still contained energy, and energy was life. No thieving seagull was going to steal life from him. He jerked his arm at the gulls. Mine, he grunted. That's mine. Squawking, the gulls hopped between his reach. Beyond his reach. Cole stretched his arm out, picked a small chunk of fish from the grass, and brought it to his mouth. After swallowing, he reached for more. Bit by bit, he ate until the few remaining pieces were too small to pinch between his fingers. Finally, he relaxed. Eating had taken his last ounce of energy. He closed his eyes as drizzle fell again. The falling moisture felt like more mosquitoes landing, but as it turned to rain, it cooled Cole's burning skin. He opened his cracked lips and let rain hit his swollen, chalky tongue. Earlier, Cole had felt hollow and weak, as if all the blood had emptied from his body. Now he felt something difficult to describe. Despite the cold, energy seeped through his body, letting him grasp thoughts and hold them in his mind. He felt satisfaction. He had provided for himself and could feel his body absorbing the food he had eaten. But still, his body desperately needed water. He was thirsty. So very thirsty. As the rain fell again, the ground softened. Cole dug with his fingers and brought mud up to smear onto his swollen neck and face. He smeared mud over his broken arm and onto his ripped open chest. Maybe this would help keep the mosquitoes away. The wet dirt soothed Cole's burning skin. When his arm tired, he rested again. Gradually, rain pooled where he had dug up mud beside him. He stared at the muddy water, then placed his hand into the puddle. Each movement was forced as he cupped his palm and brought the brown murky liquid up to his mouth. Again and again, he reached for more water. Sometimes only a few drops made it past his dried lips, but gradually moisture coated his throat and finally allowed him to swallow. Cole let his weary arm collapse to the ground. Resting, he gazed out toward the bay of the eagles snatching fish from the surface. Near the shore swam a mother seal with her pups, their heads bobbing in the water as they worked the fish schools near the rocks. Cole scanned the ground once more and caught two more worms that surfaced with the new rain. He dropped them into his mouth and chewed. The animals weren't the only ones who, were, who could forage to survive. The sound of a twig breaking was Cole's only warning. He turned his head to find the spirit bear standing barely 20 feet away, staring at him, one paw forward, as if frozen in mid-stride. The bear's shiny nose twitched as raindrops beaded into splash pearls on its shaggy hair. Its eyes glinted and flickered. Cole's heart raced and his wounds throbbed. He felt the ripping of his skin all over again and heard once more the breaking of his bones. Too numb with cold and fear to even cry out. He eyed the spirit bear standing like a carved statue. Cole licked at his cracked lips. 
Had the bear returned to kill him, or was it just toying with him? He found himself trembling with fear, not of death, but of helplessness. He hated being at the mercy of the world around him. Why didn't this monstrous white creature just walk in and finish what it started? A single bite from its massive jaw, one hard swat from its powerful paw, anything now would tip the balance and end this nightmare. One way or another, Cole decided to bring this moment to a conclusion. His mouth held little moisture, but deliberately he dredged up spit from deep in his throat, all the while meeting the bear's intense gaze with one of his own. When not one more drop of moisture would form, Cole painfully lifted his head. He sucked in the deepest breath he dared. He was spitting at more than the spirit bear. He was spitting at his life. The world would take him to the grave with a slimy goober on its face. Cole Matthews would still have the last word, preparing his final act of defiance. Cole drew his chin back. Then he spit hard, flinging the saliva with a desperate throw of his head. Pain attacked him from all sides, but he kept his eyes open. He wanted the satisfaction of watching this last moment. As if in slow motion, the glob of spit arched weakly toward the spirit bearer, but landed in the grass far short of its mark. Cole collapsed. That was it then. He had done all he could. Now the world could do as it pleased with him. The spirit bear raised its head slightly and sniffed the air with a long, curious breath. Then it started forward. Cole tensed. This was how the first attack should have ended.